Okay, I think we should get started. Welcome everybody to our plenary session A B. Um, so this is Wen Bing Lu. I'm a, currently a postdoc at Princeton University. Um, I'm happy to chair this session. So today we have uh, uh, mostly recorded sessions, uh, but two of the talks will be live. So please uh, uh, provide your questions in the Q&A session as well as on Slack. I'll be monitoring them and, uh, uh, and speak out the questions to the speaker or some, somebody else who are on the team to answer the questions. So our first speaker will be Bonito Marcote uh, from Joint Institute for VLBI um, uh, Jive. Um, and his topic would be localizing FRBs to milli arc seconds with, with EVM. Go ahead, Bonito. Okay, thank you, Ren. So, Minty Marcote, I would like, like to thank so, the organizers for letting us to give this talk here. Uh, Minty Marcote, I'm working at Jive in the Netherlands. Um, this is a talk basically on behalf of the Precise and Astroflash projects which aim to localize repeating fast reverse to the milliard second level. And here I will basically present the project and all the latest results that we've got during the lab, basically during this year. Um, but first, of course, I would like to emphasize the underlying message that will remain in this talk, actually in this session, this mainly, and our actual, actual pro, uh, project, which is that the, we really need very precise localizations of fast reverse. Uh, we know that there are a lot of implications and results that can be derived from fast reverse once we have just a, num a large number of them, of these events, even if they are not localized to very precise resolution. And for many studies, we just need those statistical uh, well, studies once we have a large number. But if we really want to understand the fundamental question, which is what's the nature of fast reverse, uh, where can be originated, and which are the objects that can be related to them, we really need to know and understand where they are produced. And for that, we really need to understand the local environments and the places where we can uh, find them. And at least in a few cases, hopefully we can directly associate them with really uh, particular objects. So for that, the only way is to have a really precise localizations of them so we can really understand where uh, they are localized and trying to understand the local environment there. And actually the Fair, very first uh, localization of a uh, fast reverse was a good example of this. Uh, already back in 2017, uh, for sure 121102, known for most of you probably, which was the first repeating fast reverse discovered. Uh, first, we localized it with the BLA, so we could obtain a precision on the level of the R second, which was enough to pinpoint it and associate it to a host galaxy. However, the most important results came with the parallel or more precise localization than with the European BLBI network, because in that case, we could localize to the millisecond level, a thousand times better. And in that case, we could be sure that this particular FRB, where the position of the bars are basically shown by the crosses on the left, they were also physically associated to a persistent radio source, really compact, less than 0.7 parsecs in size, which of course we still don't understand uh, the nature of it. It can be super luminous, supernovae, massive black hole. But at least in this case, um, until basically we heard this week, it was still the only FRB with an associated persistent counterpart. We know that these objects were physically related. And thanks to this precision plus the resolution that we could achieve with the HST, we unveil a surprising environment. We Notice that the bears were coming from this particular source that was completely inside a low metallicity star forming region of a dwarf galaxy. And of course, this was an environment that no one expected before. 
Uh, surprisingly, this is a, an environment where most of the hydrogen poor superluminous supernovae and the long year are produced. So that's why at that time we started thinking if FRBs can be, could be related somehow to this kind of other events. But it was the first case. And um, thanks to this resolution, it was the only way to be able to differentiate where in, within the galaxy the FRB was located. We also localized the second repeating fast reverse, uh, firstly discovered by the chain telescopes. In this case, we also observed with the European BLBA network, we detected four bursts. So we actually pinpointed the bursts to the two million second level only. And in this case, we found a completely different environment also, although uh, it was also related with a star forming region, but with different physical properties. In this case, uh, sorry. Yeah. In this case, we found a, a spiral galaxy similar to the Milky Way in size. And we found that the bears uh, were basically at the edge, but outside the edge of a prominent star forming region within the galaxy. And we could only resolve this with the HST, but thanks to the precision on the bears from the EBN, we could narrow down that these bears are actually around 250 parsecs outside the star forming region. So it's also uh, different from the first case. And this had a lot of implications because they are kind of close to star forming regions. Uh, almost everyone was thinking that you can have a relatively very young sources. In this case, it can be a bit uh, older than in the first case, but we are talking about 100,000 years. But in this case, you are unable to travel from, say, the star forming region. If that's your hypothesis that it was formed, the object creating the furbies were formed inside the region. So in this case, we estimated that you need at least around one mega years to travel to that position outside the region, which already uh, turns uh, down most of the models about a single active magnetar because you didn't have time to have still an active magnetar and traveling that much at the time. But this was the two uh, Fabrice located to millisecond level until this year. Uh, since then, we've had a lot of localization with different telescopes, all of them, all the other ones on the R second level. And one thing was clear, only in the cases that the galaxy is really high and it's a really close FRB, you can narrow down with it where within the galaxy you can find the bars. So here it was clear from the two images from the bottom edges where you have a spiral galaxy discovered by ASCAP and you have an FRB that is at least also possibly associated with the forming region. But actually, even in this case, and our second level doesn't allow you to narrow down where or relatively to that star forming region where the bears are produced. If inside the region, outside, that could have also some important implications here. And if we go to faster bears that are much farther away, we know that basically you can associate them with the host galaxies, but you cannot say anything else about where in that galaxy on where it's the local environment in those galaxies. So it was clear that we really need to go to higher precision and having a much larger number of FRBs localized. Because we only had two, we only have a few of the other ones where you could narrow down the local environments, but nothing else. If we really need to understand which are the typical local environments or if there are some places where are more common to find FRBs, we really need a large number of FRBs localized to million second precision. So that's why Precise was born. This is a project uh, led by Franz Christen, so Jason Hessel here, that aims to localize fast rovers to the million second level. So the key point of this is that we were already using the European BLB network for a few years, and we already localized two fast rovers. And we already got really important results from these two. 
but we really need to go to a much larger number of localizations. And the problem here is that, of course, with the EVN, we already had some limiting observing time. We still keep observing with them. But if we really want to go to a much larger number of uh, samples, we really need a much larger observing time. And that was not feasible within the European BLBA network. So what we basically did is building an ad hoc array of EVN dishes, because we know that most of them have some available time, observing time along the year. So basically we build a customized array just based on availability at different epochs. And then we managed to observe different FRBs during these years. So for different telescopes, the approach was a bit different. We have Hector's approval time. Some of the few telescopes uh, require some dedicated proposals. And we still keep one to correlate the data if we detect bursts at JIF as a regular even observation. But what we manage is to observe 100,000 of hours during the last years on different FRBs. And basically, in many cases, we have an array of even up to 10 telescopes. So we are reconstructing basically the same EVN, uh, just with more or less number of stations, depending on the epochs. And we started in 2018. During the first couple of years, we didn't detect any significant bursts, actually. But during this spring, we already started getting different results and many bursts from different FOBs. So now in the second part of the talk, I will just summarize the latest results that we've got through three different FRBs. Uh, the first one hasn't been published yet. We are still working and getting a few more bursts to make a better localization. But actually, it's quite interesting to reveal which are also our limitations. So this is 2018, 11, 19A. Uh, we got at the beginning only one burst in one of these observations with a uh, quite limited number of dishes. And also the burst was not detected in the whole band, only in the bottom part. And uh, when you only have a few dishes, one millisecond burst, then the UV coverage, how you can reconstruct the sky is quite limited too. So in these cases, in a few cases, we know that we may not be able to reconstruct the couple of millisecond level uh, precision for the FRBs, but we can see the pattern. Uh, that still allows us to narrow down it to the 100 millisecond level. So even in this case, we are already competing a bit better or at the level as ASCAP or other telescopes that are localizing FRBs. Three minutes, but this was, uh, Benito. Yeah, thanks. But this was kind of uh, the worst case the scenario, and we already get more bursts, so soon you will see a much better localization of this one. The second FRB, 2011-24A, was a quite revealing case that shows our, the importance of this precision localization. So this was a really active uh, FRB during this spring, and actually many uh, observatories already localized the bursts, ASCAP, the VLA, and the GMRT, and FAST. And all of them localize it uh, to the R second level, as is represented here by the different circles. And at the same time, in the continuum image, uh, the VLA and the GMRT detect some persistent counterparts, which are shown here on the right by the circles. And everything was consistent basically with the size of the optical galaxy, which is shown by the dots, the gray dots here. And um, but the problem here is that with this resolution, you are unable to say where in the galaxy and if the FRB is located, uh, associated with this persistent radio emission or not. But in two observations, we detected uh, seven, 18 bursts, and we could narrow down this FRB to the millisecond precision, which basically is a factor of 1,000 better than the previous ones. So we could first solve some uncertainties with the different positions that it had, and we could pinpoint within the galaxy where the FRBs were produced. Additionally, we didn't detect, as you see in the color, in the gray scale image, any persistent radio emission, which means that the emission is completely resolved out on the millisecond level, 
And then likely this is just a star formation from the galaxy, as happening many of the galaxies. So this is completely extended emission and unlikely associated with the FRB. And then I will take just the last two minutes to so the probably most interesting case, uh, 20120, which was an FRB uh, discovered by Chang. And with the resolution, they couldn't narrow down what was the counterpart, but they already have four different candidates. And the important part is this was kind of associated with M81, for sure, because of the DM. So I made it the closest one to the Earth so far, a part of the galactic uh, magnetar. So we kept observing this one for different epochs. We detected basically five different bursts in three observations. As you saw from Kenzie's talk, the properties of the bears were quite curious and really now from a few cases. But here I will just focus on the localization of it. So we detected different bears. Uh, one of them it was too faint to do an image. And here you have the individual bears due to UV coverage and resolution, we couldn't narrow down that well or the reconstruction of the image still didn't allow us, allow us to pinpoint it to a, a very particular side lobe in the image plane. But when go, combining all these bears, we've been able to actually narrow down to the a couple of milliseconds for millisecond level, which actually this is an updated image from the uh, draft that we put in archive. So actually now we have a much better localization. And interestingly, uh, here the white circle uh, represents the a global cluster associated with M81. So it's clear that FRB is contained and relatively close to the center of this global cluster. It is also shown here with the optical images. So this is the global cluster. This is the profile, the brightness profile of the optical emission on the cluster. And we see that the FRB that is uh, shown here by the red little dot is actually probably significant. We are still working on the systematic possible uncertainties between optical and radio, but it looks like the FRB is actually a bit offset from the center of the global cluster that is represented here by the black circle. And this had a really important uh, implications because a global cluster is a really old system. You do not expect any very young magnetar inside that, at least not one produced by a, a typical corpse labs. So we are basically uh, removing all the uh, the most promising scenarios that we've been playing around with for the previous FRBs. But in here, you still have either other possibilities of formation, like a creation induced or merger induced collapse, or we know that in global clusters, you can find a relatively large population of low mass X ray binaries. So this is also one of the implications that you may have here. Uh, if we go to the continuum image, we didn't take anything here, neither from the EVN yeah. or Sorry, the- Benito, do, you, do you have much more? Because no, we're, not leaving, the summary. we're not leaving much time for questions. Anymore. Yeah, it's a summary. Okay, great. So we don't detect any persistent emission, neither on the EVN and the, uh, VLA scales, sorry. And this is basically the summary. This is the closest extragalactic FRB localized today in a very completely different environment. And you've already had two different scenarios on this one. One from Kremer on formation scenarios in global clusters. And if you are interested in properties of the FRB, you can see you can see Nemo stock. So that's it. Thanks. So Benito is here to answer questions. Um, we already have one from Brian Gensler. What's the fastest possible turnaround time for the following two uh, things? Knowing, knowing that you already saw a burst. The other one is going getting an initial uh, sub arc second position. That's a nice question. Uh, I... I think I will say that it's kind of similar, but right now, after observations, we can get 
a detection of a burst uh, by looking at single disk data within a couple of days on average, although sometimes it can go up to one week, depends on other observations that we are analyzing. And getting the position, once we have the correlated data, it can be also in one, two days. Um, my limitation is also in between those ones. So we need to, if once we detect the burst, we need to transfer the data to Jive to get it correlated. So sometimes that can get some de uh, de de days of delay because uh, transferring the data from the different stations plus the correlation. So on average we can get maybe within one week, sometimes we can get everything, the detection of a burst plus an initial localization, but that can also go up to two weeks, maybe a couple of weeks uh, with the whole process and roughly Doing the imaging on doing the pull search is kind of the same on time. Sometimes you have some overheads in between. Thanks. So given that there are no other questions, I want to ask about the, the optical image of the globular cluster of M81. Is that the best one that we have right now? Can we do better in, in terms of like HST or space? space-based yeah. optical image. Your special special resolution is much better than the optical resolution looks like. Yeah, we are right now limited by the optical there. Uh, yes, we would love to have HD uh, image. We still don't have for this one. Uh, for sure, that will be much better than the one that we have. Uh, for the ground-based telescopes, this is already quite on the limit or you can improve it, but not significantly. But yeah, we still need to go or mm -hmm. trying to get data in XT and that will significantly improve. Although for the size of the global cluster, we already know that it's resolved in the current images. And we know that with the HT, we will not resolve individual stars in the global cluster. Mm -hmm. yeah, so course. you will improve it, but it's not like in other cases that probably can be really significant. Mm -hmm. Shami mentioned that HST observations are already approved. So what happened? So one last question. So from Louis Marmet, do you keep a keep track of keep keep a catalog of all localized FRBs? I guess yes. Well, yeah, there are some online catalogs. We don't do it by ourselves, but they are FRB cut, .org that keeps track of those ones. And I think there is a couple of other websites with the host galaxies or at least the localized ones. So yeah, we don't do it by ourselves, but there are public catalogs already on FOB. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So let's move on to our next speaker, um, Sriharsh Tendulkar from Tata Institute of Fundamental Research and the National Center for Radio Astrophysics. So he will talk about localization of Chime FRB repeaters with VLA real fast system. Shri Harsh, you will not be here to answer questions. Please uh, direct your questions to Slack. Can we can we play Shri Harsh? Mm -hmm. Preparing this beautiful conference in the time of pandemic and having me give me an opportunity to uh, speak here. I'm going to tell you about uh, our campaign to localize Chime FRB repeaters with the Jansky VLA. So this is this talk is, in, is on the behalf of the Chime FRB real fast as well as the VLite fast collaborations. So Benito has already told you told us about why we need precise localization. So I won't belabor this point, but I do want to show what, what it looks like for an optical astronomer. Chime FRB's localization is order of 10 to 30 arc minutes. If you uh, go straight from the metadata of the FRB, and there are a lot of galaxies in that region. In this uh, image on the right hand side, I'm showing you uh, a ke deep Keck image of the first FRB that was the first repeating FRB that was discovered, FRB 121102. And this red circle is a three arc minute error region for uh, taken from the Arecibo. Okay, this is 10 times smaller than what Chime localizes. And there are hundreds of galaxies in that region. And I'm betting that none of us, even the original localizers of this FRB can point out to me the galaxy on this image. 
you have to really zoom in to a tiny corner and then figure out that this galaxy, the FRB actually comes from this tiny little speck of light right here. So this is just to emphasize how hard it is to identify uh, host galaxies of FRBs. And in this particular case, because it was a dwarf galaxy, which are prolific in the universe, it is really hard. Once you get a, a, a host galaxy, of course, you get the redshift, you get energetics, you, you can try to understand the environment, the star formation rate, metallicity, that gives you a lot more information about FRBs and where they originate. To drive home this point, let me point out that for a few low DM FRBs, we can identify the host galaxy itself with arc-minute localization. The case in point are, uh, is this excellent work by uh, Mohit Bharadwaj, for example, where we are able to localize, uh, we are able to identify this FRB 2020, uh, 2020-01-20E with, uh, as it is coming from the outsides of uh, M81, but that just means that it is a cool repeater. It's a nearby repeater. That's nice. But when you do an arc second, sub arc second localization, as um, Benito pointed out, you start realizing the science implications of it. You start asking why, why in the world is this FRB in a globular curve? So the sub arc second localization is critical for understanding the local environment. You might find that an FRB is in a star forming galaxy, but it might not be in a star forming region in that galaxy. So it might be a completely different source. With that in mind, we had to start localizing Chime FRB repeaters. And Chime intrinsically cannot localize to sub arc second precision. So we have started using other interferometers like the VLA to localize uh, FRBs. And the VLA has two different backend commensal observing systems which search for transients. So the real pass system developed by KC Law, uh, Paul Demarest, and their collaborators works with uh, the high frequency bands of the VLA and it searches five to 10 millisecond sampled visibilities and it images them uh, after dispersion to search for transients. There's also another system called the V-Light, which is the VLA uh, low frequency ionospheric uh, experiment, which is built by Tracy Clark, uh, Namir Kasim and their collaborators, which observes from 230 to 500 megahertz. This is a low frequency system which has a completely separate signal processing uh, pipeline compared to the regular uh, VLA correlator. And the VLight fast backend on this system searches for transients in real time. Now, both of these systems commensally give you deep imaging as well. So you can observe the same patch of the sky, search for transients, and get uh, deep images at different frequencies and different uh, angular resolutions. Now, the idea is that these interferometers have a limited field of view. So their, the FRB detection rate for a blind search is fairly low. And Chime obviously is detecting a lot of FRB repeaters. So we should be able to try to target Chime FRB repeater fields and then localize these repeaters. And uh, as it so happens, the primary beam of the VLA is fairly well matched to the Chime FRB localization precision. So here I'm showing you the 32 arc minute uh, full width at half power uh, beam of the VLA, which is well matched with the Chime FRB header localization, the main lobe of it. There are some side lobes in some cases where uh, Chime is unable to distinguish between the main lobe and the side lobe localization, but those can be eliminated through Chime FRB baseband data and intensity data uh, which improves the precision, localization precision to about 10 to 20 arc minutes. So the game plan uh, for us has been to use the VLA to observe Chime FRB repeater fields. We have been doing this since uh, 20, uh, the end, uh, second half of 2018, and we have observed for almost 180 uh, triggered hours and 100 hours of quote unquote filler time. I'll tell you what, uh, what those are. There are two observing strategies. One is to have triggered observations, which is based on the idea that we see temporal clustering of uh, FRB. So FRBs have these activity periods, which seem to be order of a week, but that's only for the repeaters that we do know of. So we have seen, for example, uh, FRB 2011, 2024, where there is a huge period of, there is a period of huge activity where all of these uh, localizations were done. And before that and after that, there has been absolutely nothing. And then there are filler observations, which we 
implemented because uh, we need to hedge against the ignorance of uh, this kind of clustering. Maybe FRBs don't cluster, maybe FRBs cluster at different frequencies. So we also need to hedge against uh, that bias. So our triggered observation procedure is fairly simple. We have a list of known repeaters, and then we wait for a chime FRB detection, which operates between 400 to 800 megahertz. And once a detection is done, we trigger the VLA to observe about five to seven times with two hour long observations. And then uh, we just stop and wait for the next trigger. These observations are spread out, spread out over a week or so, uh, because that is the typical time scale we have been seeing from uh, other repeaters. This, of course, assumes that the activity at 400 to 800 megahertz implies uh, activity at 1.4 gigahertz or uh, slightly higher, which we might be using for uh, the VLA observations. Now, this is uh, reasonably true for uh, repeaters like FRB 180916, FRB 2011-24, uh, where we have localized, uh, uh, we have detected uh, bursts in L band right after chime, chime observations. But we don't know whether this is really true for any other observation. So one of the things that keeps me up at night is what if this activity at 400 to 800 megahertz doesn't reflect activity at 1.4 gigahertz? Uh, for example, the first repeating FRB, FRB 121102, is prolific at 1.4 gigahertz, but Chime has observed exactly one burst from it. It is not even a repeater at Chime. So there could be some Chime repeaters which might not emit at 1.4 gigahertz or you know they might emit at completely different times uh, there could be you know for frb 18916 the periodic repeater we know that high frequency observations high frequency bursts come later in the uh, activity window whereas uh, low frequency bursts come earlier but what if this trend is reversed we will never be able to trigger uh, vla observations based on chime and then have success so we use this idea of filler observations, which are short observing blocks, which are used to fill holes in uh, the VLA schedule. So we schedule, uh, we make scheduling blocks of 30 minutes, 30 minutes to one hour, and we put them into the VLA queue. But there is no guarantee that these will be observed. These will be executed, and they have the lowest scheduling probability. So give, if we are granted 100 hours by the time allocation committee, we would actually you know, get observations for about 50 to 60 hours, or maybe even less. But despite that, despite having only, you know, observed about 300 hours over the past uh, three years, we have had quite a bit of success. Uh, we have deep observations of 13 active repeater fields in a mixture of A, B, and C, A, B, C, and D configs uh, for the VLA, which have different angular resolution. So we can figure out whether a particular radio source is resolved or not. We have not yet uh, detected or identified rather a persistent radio source in any of the localized FRBs yet. But we have detected FRBs. There's uh, one FRB uh, which, was uh, which was detected as a serendipitous FRB in uh, one of the repeater fields. Uh, we have detected and localized FRB 180916, which is the uh, periodic FRB. We have also localized FRB uh, 201124 which I'll talk about a little bit. And lastly, I'll show some very interesting results from FRB 201130, which we have localized and we are still trying to uh, understand what, what, this, uh, what the environment is telling us. So I'll talk, tell about some unpublished work uh, in there. So the serendipitous FRB was discovered uh, in, while, uh, while we were observing this field for FRB 20, uh, 2018. 0814, which is R2, which is the low DM uh, FRB with a uh, DM of about 189 parsec per cubic centimeter. And we found this FRB, uh, which had a DM of 960 parsec per cubic centimeter, which is one of the highest uh, uh, DMs for a localized FRB. Uh, this, you, as you can see at the bottom, uh, this FRB was localized next to two fairly faint galaxies. And you can see different images in V band, R band, and I band, which is uh, lower, shorter wavelength to longer wavelength for uh, non optical astronomers. And there are the two galaxies uh, are have different colors. So the so galaxy B is brighter in the blue, and galaxy A is brighter in the red wavelengths. And they're 
they're late type galaxies. So they are uh, they have an older population and they don't have any emission line. So it is very hard to do spectroscopy on these. And we are not able to get a spectroscopic redshift at all. So we, all we have is an estimate of uh, the photometric redshift, which turns out to be about 0.6, which places this at as one of the farthest FRBs that we have detected and localized. Now, this really highlights the challenge of uh, identifying the hosts for high redshift galaxies. We want to go to redshift three uh, galaxies, but if FRBs are going to be localized outside of faint uh, non-star forming galaxies where we don't get any emission lines, our, our work is going to be really, really hard. The other FRB that we uh, localized was FRB 2011-24, which was quite hyperactive uh, in uh, CHIME. And so once we had CHIME detections, we triggered the VLA to get a very precise localization. Uh, there is a slight uh, offset from uh, the ASCAP localization, which was later confirmed by GMRT as well as EVN, as Benito showed. Now this FRB comes from a, an extremely massive galaxy. So this galaxy has, uh, this is the most massive massive repeater host compared to any other uh, repeater. And it has the persistent radio emission from this uh, galaxy turns out to be consistent with whatever star formation is occurring in there. There is about two solar masses of uh, two solar masses per year of star formation, which is happening. And there is no point like persistent radio source, uh, unlike what we have seen in FRB 12, 11, 02, and uh, the new FRB that Shivani Bhandari and her co colleagues have localized. Now coming to the unpublished image, this is a FRB which we localized earlier uh, in February. This is an unpublished time repeater and the details of this uh, repeater will uh, will be published soon and you should three, see three minutes, three you this. Yeah, thank you, Ben. So this is a nearby FRB with a DM excess of about 210 parsec per cubic centimeter, and which means that it's the maximum redshift that it could be at is about 0.2. And you can see that uh, this FRB was localized with a precision of about one half second because this was localized with the DLA VLA D configuration, which is the most compact configuration with the large, uh, with the shortest baseline. So the Precision, the precision is not as high as it could have been with the A configuration or one of the bigger configurations. At the same time, there was no uh, detection in V light fast at low frequency. So there's a uh, 1.4 gigahertz detection, but nothing at lower frequencies. And interestingly, there was also a rapid X-ray follow-up thanks to the Swift Guano team, where Swift XRT slewed to this location within 40 minutes of uh, the burst detection. And uh, we didn't see anything but it is an interesting uh, uh, limit which we can put on afterglows. Now this FRB was detected on 6th of February, but, uh, and we got some imaging of uh, the field, but after that it has, we have had a few weeks of bad weather. And then this FRB went behind a sun constraint till 2nd of August, which is yesterday. And we have not been able to do good spectroscopy of this field. So I've, I've been citing Murphy's law at this point because it just seems to be affecting us in all possible ways. Now, these are this is a deep image from Megacam uh, on the CFHT of this source. The, the dashed circle shows you a one half second, one sigma uh, error region around the FRB location. And there are a bunch of sources which I've localized. You can see it's a fairly complex and crowded field. Now, these two are clearly extended. Source one is also slightly extended. And I can tell you a little bit more about these sources. We got spectroscopy for source four and five. It turns out that they are elliptical galaxies with, spe with a spectroscopic redshift of 0.52. So they're clearly background galaxies and they're extremely bright. Their uh, absolute magnitudes are about minus 22 in our band. Source two is a point like foreground star and source one is extended. It's possibly a dwarf galaxy and it has uh, an apparent magnitude of about 23.5 and we are trying to undertake the, the spectroscopy of source one, two, and three uh, as we speak. And hopefully once we get good weather and low air mass, we'll be able to update everybody on it. Now, if you use the uh, path inferences, you can try to figure out, assign uh, posterior probabilities that this FRB is associated with one of these sources. And if you take all the non-point like sources in a 30 arc second uh, radius, it turns out that source one is basically the only candidate 
which could be the host. Now, assuming that uh, source one is at about a redshift of about 0.2, it has an absolute magnitude of minus 17, minus 17, which means it is a dwarf galaxy, very much like FRB 1211.02. But this this FRB has a separation of about seven kiloparsec from the center of this galaxy. It is not uh, on the star forming region as was the case for you know, FRB 1211.02, FRB 1809.16, and any of the other very well localized uh, repeaters. The deep radio imaging of this uh, location also reveals no uh, radio source with a limit of about two times 10 to the 37 hertz per second. So this is a very unusual location. There is literally no star formation lit or any significant stellar population at that location. Um, which is what is confounding us right now. The caveat, of course, is that if there were uh, uh, globular clusters like the one in M81, we would not see it. But this is a dwarf galaxy, so you know the probability of having a having globular clusters it becomes equ equivalently lower. So to summarize, uh, finding chime uh, chime FRB repeaters with the VLA requires has taken. A, has required us uh, a lot of patience and time from us. Our early efforts were not very successful, but now we do have a lot of results. And we have we are trying to better understand FRB behavior so that we can follow up these repeaters uh, more effectively. And of course, we have more uh, we have interesting science results in the pipeline. So do stay tuned, and we shall uh, publish shortly. Thank you. So anybody on the team of Sriharsh would like to come up answer questions? Um, I don't see. Oh, so there's a question from uh, Javier Prochaska. Given the seven kiloparsec offset of FRB of the of the localized FRB from its putative dwarf galaxy host, does it give you a pause about the putative host galaxy of the other one, which is FRB 2019-05-20? The other one, which is, I think that one has a really, has a really persistent radio source, whereas this one doesn't have one. Given that there is nobody here to answer questions, there's another question, which, uh, there seems to be another source to the left, pre presumably east of source four and five, uh, that looks like a galaxy. Was it not considered for pass? And to me, that galaxy looks really far away. Um, um, okay, let's uh, pr proceed to the next to our next speaker. Um, I guess uh, Shri Harsh will answer the questions later on on Slack. So our next speaker is Laura uh, Dreyason uh, from, uh, from Jot Rio Bank Center of Astrophysics, University of Manchester. And she will talk about the first sub arc second localization, uh, localized FRB with Meerkat. Uh, thanks for that, Ben. Um, so as Ben said, I'm gonna be talking about our localized FRBs with Meerkat. So the work that I'm presenting today is a collaboration um, mainly between Meertrap and Thundercat, um, as well as a couple of others, which I'll mention later. Meertrap is the more transients and pulsars group led by Ben at the University of Manchester. Um, and we're a fully commensal project, uh, observing commensally with the Meerkat large survey projects and a few other things. Thundercat, which is also an acronym, but I always forget it because it's really long. Um, is the Meerkat Large Survey Project investigating and searching for um, variable and transient sources with Meerkat. So they focus a lot on X-ray binaries, cataclysmic variables, that sort of thing, and following up those sources, um, but also has a commensal aspect uh, searching other LSP Large Survey Project um, images and their own images as well. So the first FRB I'm going to talk about has the great name FRB6, that's not its official name. Um, and this work is in preparation. So uh, the key observations for this are Thundercat observations of the low mass X-ray binary GX339-4. 
So we're really looking in the galactic plane, we're just four degrees away. These observations up until the imaging step are processed by Lilia Tremu um, because she is the Thundercat lead for GX339 itself. Um, the field has been observed weekly since September 2018 and Thundercat has committed to observing the field weekly for the full five years that the LSP is running. Each weekly observation is 10 to 15 minutes uh, with a minimum integration time of eight seconds. So that's the shortest image that we can make. And Meertrap started observing commensally with this, uh, with, the, with Thundercat observations in general in this field from September 2020. And you can see a nice image of the field in the background. It has lots of point sources, which is always good. So FRB6 was detected on the 5th of April this year uh, during Thundercat observations of GX339-4. You can see its stats here. Um, its uh, DM excess is 200 units. Um, and you can see that we've got a nice little bit of scattering there as well. It has really nice signal to noise, so that's a good sign that we'll be able to see it in the images. So what I then did is take that 10 minute um, observation, the image the imaging that's been processed by Lilia, and I made 73 eight second slices so that covers the whole um, epoch. And then I processed all of those images using the LOFAR trap. So this is a, a pipeline for um, processing a time series of radio images. And then it extracts light curves and some variability parameters. So here I show those variability parameters against um, flux density. So that's the median flux of the light curves for all of the um, unresolved sources in the field. So I've manually removed the resolved sources because they cause a bit of a problem for me. Um, this is the eta parameter, so that's based on the reduced chi-squared, where you assume that every source is constant and then calculate the reduced chi-squared. So if, you, if a source is not constant, it should be an outlier. The v parameter is the modulation parameter, so that's the standard deviation of the light curve divided by the mean. And the psi parameter is a parameter that I uh, created myself for using the median absolute deviation. So that's uh, specifically designed to find single epoch outliers or sources that sort of burst every now and then. And we can see in all of these plots that we have two outliers. These are the same source in each of these plots. Um, so what's this one, this outlier? Um, this is sort of our, our serendipitous test source in, in all of these GX339 searches for variables, um, the mode changing pulsar. Um, so in eight seconds or 10 minutes, um, it varies in flux density so that create some interesting variability. So we know what this source is um, and we can rule that one out as our FRB. But we have one other outlier um, and the light curve of this source looks like this. So this is really great. Um, this eight second slice was also the eight second slice that we detected the FRB with Meertrap. So this ticks sort of ticks all the boxes. So we have a, a single interesting outlier that has one um, eight second slice that it's bright it's the correct eight second slice. Um, and yeah, it's the only it's the only outlier apart from the pulsar. So that's all really good signs. We've found our FRB. Before I show the images and go into the localization, um, I had to check the absolute astrometry of the images that we have. So there are five unresolved ATPMN ATCA sources in the field of view. And the ATPMN survey has a medium, median absolute astrometric uncertainty of of 0.4 arc seconds in RA and DEC. So I extracted the RA and DEC from all of the sources in the 10 minute image, the Meerkat 10 minute image, and compared the, uh, the ATPMN and Meerkat positions of those five um, sort of reference sources. And you can see the separation here in arc seconds between the Meerkat and ATPMN positions. So it's not perfect, not too bad. So to improve this, I, um, oh, but first these are the sources, so you can see they're nice and unresolved and bright. Um, and to improve the, the positions and, and get them a bit closer to the ATPMN positions, um, I solved for an affine transformation matrix and apply that to um, all of the positions of all of the sources in both the eight second images and the 10 minute image. So because I solved for the affine transformation matrix, um, in the 10 minute image, I wanted to double check that that still applies in our eight second image. So I compared 
um, bright sources brighter than a millijansky in the eight second and 10 minute images. And they have a median separation of 0.2. So that's within our 0.4 arc second um, uh, absolute astrometric, astrometric uncertainty. And you can see here, this is the separation before applying the transformation to the meerkat images and the separation after between the reference sources. So we've improved a lot and we've got that 0.4, which is what we wanted. So we have this source. What does it look like? Um, so this is the off pulse eight seconds before the FRB and this is the FRB itself. So uh, it's a nice unresolved source. It appears and then disappears. So that's exactly what we're looking for. So I extracted the position from the eight second uncorrected um, image using Pi BDSF. And that has uncertainties of 0.1 and 0.2 courtesy of the nice bright signal to noise, even in an eight second image. So we don't have any DM correction. Um, and then I added in quadrature the 0.4 arc second uncertainty um, from the ATPMN uh, astrometry. So that means our corrected position for this FRB has uncertainties of 0.4 and 0.5 arc seconds in RA and DEC, which is really exciting. Because um, Thundercat has observed this field a lot, uh, we also have a three hour combined image of the fields so that's from combining a few weeks of 10 minute observations. Uh, which you can see here on the right. So this is the FRB detection eight second image on the left and uh, the deeper image on the right. And you can see that there's a really faint extended radio source about eight, seven, eight arc seconds away from the position of the FRB. So faint extended resolved radio source uh, hints towards a galaxy. So what does this look like in the optical? So this is a stacked uh, deck caps um, image in the optical, the red numbers are the Gaia distances of those point sources. Um, and you can see the cyan circle here is the position of the FRB and the yellow circle is the position of that extended radio source. So you can see that the FRB is on top of this nice optical point source. Uh, just based off the distance, that source would have half the DM of the FRB. Um, but we also did take a spectrum an optical spectrum of that source and it's A star. So it's highly unlikely that the FRB is coming from a star that's a bit too close by. However, this extended optical source um, looks also like a galaxy and it's on top of our resolved uh, radio source. Um, we're awaiting a, a salt spectrum of this faint optical source. And it's important to note here as well that we are looking through the galaxy. So the extinction is quite high. So we expect this optical source actually goes out much further, um, but we don't get that faint emission due to extinction in this direction. So we have a localized FRB and we have a pretty good candidate for the host um, of this FRB. I mentioned that we have been observing the Thundercat field since 2018, but we only started uh, observing commensally with Mere Trap in September last year. Um, I have been imaging all of those 10 minute images to eight second um, slices, which takes a really long time. So I, my, uh, the computers that are running it have not finished, but so far we have over 6,000 eight second images and I have um, run those through the trap as well um, and haven't found any other bursts for FRB6. Um, so, so far no repeats, but we're still observing commensally with Thundercat and they're observing it every week. So we have plenty of chances to see if it does. So we've localized an FRB to uh, better than arc second precision, and uh, we have a likely uh, host for it, but so far no repeats. Um, a little, as a little bit of a bonus, I have two more sources for you. So let's talk about FRB seven, um, which you can tell I got a bit, a bit excited about my stamp font. So I, I put it here as well. This is preliminary. Um, so still a bit of work to be done here, but this is the, the sort of first results from it. Um, so this is, uh, you can see the FRB here. It's an incoherent beam only detection. Um, as Fabian mentioned in his talk in the previous session, session seven, um, we have incoherent beam and coherent beams that we search, um, but this one was an incoherent beam only. Uh, this FRB was found in collaboration with an open time proposal team led by Christo Venter. So uh, we uh, observed, Mirtrap observed as part of that. The reason that they pointed at this particular field is because there are two other known FRBs um, within one degree 
of where we detected this one. Um, so it's a little bit fainter than the previous FRB. And because uh, Christo's team was looking for FRBs and trying to localize them, they imaged, uh, sorry, they, they um, observed with two second time resolution in the images. So here we have the two second off and then on um, of this source. Um, it's a bit fainter and we're also working to improve the calibration and processing of the imaging, but you can see, clearly see here a source that wasn't there before. It's also the only source that goes on and off at the right time um, in these images. Because of the processing and, and the fainter, that this source is just fainter than FRB6, we have localized it to about an arc second in both RA and DEC. And in the optical, um, so this, this region has a, a radius of three arc seconds, otherwise it cuts straight through that faint source. Um, this is the, that position using the um, Goodman telescope. And you can see that there is a, a couple of optical sources nearby and a really faint one um, really close by. We don't know anything more about these sources at this point in time. And another bonus, um, FRB8. Again, this is some preliminary work. Two minutes. No worries. Um, so this source, where you can see here, is, is really narrow and also a lot fainter than the previous two sources. Um, so unfortunately, we can't get the imaging localization as these are eight second images um, observed by Mongoose, another Meerkat large survey project. However, this source was detected in both the incoherent beam and some coherent beams. So that means that we can do localization using a tide array beam localization method um, by Tian, one of my Meerkat colleagues. Um, so you can see this FRB has a DM of 750 units. And this work was done as part of the F to the power of four collaboration. Um, so using the uh, tide array beam localization methods. So these are our two coherent beams, the large regions that you can see. The smallest region is the um, one sigma localization and the larger region is the two sigma localization. So even though we can't get this, this FRB in an image, we can still get pretty good localization. Um, and you can see in this Gemini image um, that I had to tweak a lot to, to get these really faint optical sources to show up. So again, we, we don't know more about these sources, but there are a couple of optical sources within the one sigma region. So in summary, um, we performed our first uh, sub arc second localization of a mere trap detected FRB um, in collaboration with the Thundercat um, LSP. And we also searched for repeat bursts because of um, past observations of the same field, but didn't find anything. We have a preliminary, pre preliminary localization of FRB7 in two second images um, with uncertainties of about an arc second. And we also have a tide array beam localization of another FRB, which gives us a few arc seconds uh, localization. And thank you to our collaborators as well. It's really exciting to work with Meertrap as well as the other teams. Thank you. I, we still have some time for questions to Laura. I don't think Laura's team is here to answer questions, but you can post the questions to Slack channel. Um, I guess we should keep going uh, to our next speaker, uh, Adam Deller from uh, Swinburg University of Technology. And he will talk about the Atmos 2D FRB detection and localization engine. Thanks, Ben. Um, it's a pleasure to get the opportunity to talk about Atmos 2D uh, today. And I'm doing this on behalf of the, the whole team, who you can see down at the bottom of the slide here. It's a, it's a big team that's been, been working very hard for the last couple of years. So a little bit about um, the Malonglo telescope, which is where uh, the utmost facility um, uh, operates out of. Uh, it's about 50 kilometers away from Canberra, the capital city of Australia. It's over 50 years old, and it's still the largest collecting area in the Southern Hemisphere, about 35,000 square meters or so. Um, and it consists of two cylindrical reflectors um, located or laid down orthogonally to each other. So the east-west arm can steer uh, north and south, but the north-south arm is fixed. It's just a transit facility. 
um, and it operates at about 840 megahertz. So the east-west arm of Upmost has been operational for about five years now, and in that time it's detected uh, 18 FRBs. And, um, but because it's only laid out in one direction, it hasn't been able to localize them to, to galaxies, so to their host galaxies. So the almost 2D project is uh, to, to bring the north-south arm back to life so that we can use this facility to, to localize FRBs in real time when we find them. So, uh, and so this is just the, uh, the layout as seen from the top. So in the blue, that's the uh, existing arm that's uh, about 1.6 kilometers long. And in the green highlighted is the north-south arm, also about 1.6 kilometers long that we've been working on. So I just wanted to go back to basics for a second, just to, to sort of like uh, motivate uh, the, the design approach that we've taken here. Um, we want to have large fields of view so that we can see, you know, we have a good chance of finding lots of FRBs. And we do that by getting uh, small antenna elements. So in this example that I've chosen here, um, looking at a reference frequency of one gigahertz, if you take a 10 by 10 meter collecting area, you can get a two by two uh, field of view on the sky. And so if you want to add sensitivity, um, instead of making just a, the single element bigger, which would give you a smaller beam, you get more of these elements and you add them together um, to form uh, one one tide beam on the sky, and you can do that more than once. Um, and if you've got a fully filled aperture like this, then to tile out the whole primary beam, you need as many uh, beam uh, uh, sorry synthesized beams on the sky as you have antenna elements that you're adding together. But the trouble is, um, we want to be able to localize our sources to to galaxies, and to do that, we want a precision of about an arc second or better, depending on what your ultimate science game is. Um, and that means because we can't really localize to better than maybe a tenth to a hundredth of a beam, depending on how well you can calibrate, the beams themselves can't be bigger than about an arc minute and ideally more like you know, 10 arc seconds or so. And so if you look at the, the wavelengths that we're observing at, that means you need baselines of you know, one to 10 kilometers. But the number of beams that you need then is rising with the, with the baseline length squared and the computational intensity is going you know, roughly linearly with the number of beams. So that's a problem. So I've broken the scale here, but uh, if you were silly enough to try and build a, a 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer fully filled aperture, and you wanted to then uh, image the full two by two squared, two by two degrees that you could have if the individual elements were 10, 10 meters each, then you'd need like a million beams. And uh, you know, that's, that's probably not quite, quite feasible. And we can't afford to build like 100 square kilometers of collecting area. We're sort of struggling to do one at the moment. Um, but even if you don't fully fill that aperture, the number of beams that you need in order to, to fully sample the, the, the primary field of view doesn't change. So if you, if you only have a few, a few stations, you still need that, that million beams if you want to do them at the full resolution from the get-go. So the compromise, the, the smart way to, to, to do it is to pack a lot of your collecting area into a densely filled detector block um, and have some outlying antennas that you don't add into the sun when you're just searching. So here I'm showing a sort of square detector block where you don't need, you still need a kind of largish number of beams, uh, depending on how, how big that detector block is, but uh, not a ridiculous number to, to fill the full field of view. And then when you find something, if you've saved the raw data from not just this, but also these outlying antennas, you can go back and make an image and, and localize with much higher precision to the precision that you'd like to do. Um, and the, the point that I'd like to make is that if you have a fully filled block, it doesn't matter what shape that block is, whether it's a, a square or a, or a long, long line, you still need the same number of beams to fully search out that, um, that full field of view on the sky as you have antenna elements going into it. So if you stretch, uh, take all of your antenna elements and stretch them out in a long line, like you have for, for utmost um, with, a, with this 1.6 kilometer long arm, then if you have uh, of order a few hundred primary antenna elements, then you need of order a few hundred beams to, to search out the, that full field of view. And this, the shape of the individual beams is kind of funny then, the, the kind of long skinny uh, slices uh, cutting across the main primary beam, um, but you still get the full, the full field of view back. And so then if you go and add yourself some outriggers, coincidentally in a, in a straight line here, then you can go back and uh, image with the, that uh, full resolution in both directions and be able to localize the sources. So that's what led us to, to Upmost 2D. Um, and the idea was we wanted to build this quite, quite cheaply because uh, we didn't have, a, didn't have a huge amount of money to lay out on, on new hardware. So we designed this modular, uh, what we call a cassette, 
which has uh, eight, eight feeds on it and an analog beamformer and some, some low cost, low noise amplifiers. And we went out and we we're going to plop them down on the north south arm so that we could uh, slave it to the east west arm and, uh, and uh, download voltages every time we got an FRB and localize it. But it turned out that the system was so good, it was about eight times more sensitive than the system that was deployed on the east west arm and had a larger field of view that we decided to change our approach a little bit. So this is what we had up until uh, sort of this year on the on utmost, where just the east west arm was operating as shown in the blue there, and we had uh, of order 500 fan beams that we were um, uh, searching for FRBs, and we were going to pop down a couple of these cassettes along the north south arm at various places, um, so that we could localize FRBs that were found with the east west arm, but. Because the, the new system was so sensitive, what we've done is we've put the, the, a, a fair number of these cassettes together in a detector block on the, on the north-south arm. And so now we have a second detector um, where the number of beams is quite small because the number of cassettes is quite small and they're in a, in a block quite close together. Um, but we have this very large field of view. And so we have this complementary dual detector system. So any FRB that we are able to detect with either arm, whether the trigger comes from the east-west arm or comes from the north-south arm, will be localizable if it falls within this little area here, this circle that's about two and a half degrees across. Um, because it will be, uh, you know, if, whether seen by the north-south arm or the east-west arm, it will be bright enough to be seen by the other arm as well. But for bursts that are quite bright, more than about 20 sigma or so, we'll be able to detect them even if they happen to fall a bit outside of the primary beam of the, the complementary arm. So say the north-south arm was to detect an FRB down here a little bit outside the east-west arm's field of view, if it's bright enough, we'll still be able to, to, to find it and bring it back. So with this layout that we have now, the synthesized beam, um, the resolution of the, the images that we can make with Utmost 2D uh, is just under one arc minute. So it's just a little bit elliptical. And so the localization precision that we'll get back from that is of order one to five arc seconds. And that's do dominated by the systematics more so than the signal to noise. So a little bit earlier this year, we completed our full rollout um, of 66 cassettes deployed on the, on the north-south arm. And we now have the north-south um, uh, fan beam formation of those 192 beams, which I showed here running continuously, along with some, some other beams that we can uh, direct uh, steer more precisely that we use for pulsar timing, and I'll come to that later. Um, both, of the being, uh, both, of, both of the arms run continuously a voltage buffer so that whenever we get a trigger, we can dump the, those voltages and, and image offline. Presently, the triggers are only coming from the east-west detector because at the moment we're retraining the detector system for the, for the north-south arm using data that's been taken from the north-south arm data. While we were deploying the, the hardware, we were training the uh, classification system using east-west arm data. And so now we're, we've got the real data from on the sky that we're using to train the north-south arm. Uh, and we can also set off uh, manual triggers if we want to, to observe a calibrator source. So together, the, the addition of the new north-south arm is expected to roughly double the event rate that we get out of the, the utmost facility to more like 10 FRBs per year, of which maybe 40% of them will be localizable to this arc second precision. So um, the two arms will be running con continuously and independently, forming their own tide beams and their own uh, fan beams to do pulsar timing and FRB searching. Uh, and we have independent correlators for the two of them so that they can be calibrated internally. But then we also have to calibrate them against each other so that we can make a you know, combined image with the, the baselines between the north-south and the east-west stations. Um, to do that, we cross-correlate the, the saved voltage data. And this is just a an example from a little while ago now of, a, of a, um, about five seconds of data that we dumped on uh, one of our calibrator sources to show that we can actually get a fringe. And the imaging of the correlated data sets that we'll be using to localize the FRBs is what's sort of being commissioned right now. Um, and we'd be one week further ahead if I hadn't been distracted by so many awesome talks at this uh, meeting so far. So I wanted to spend a bit of time now talking about the um, the new detector system on the on the north south arm, and so this is work that's been done by my PhD student Ayushi, and she has a poster that you can all go and check out. I highly recommend. Um, and we live in a we live in a pretty hostile environment in in Malongolo. We're not so far away from a major city. There's a there's roads that run past, and so we have a lot of 
rate of radio frequency interference that comes mostly from phone calls. And so what this is an example here, which is showing a single phone call in the Telstra band. Um, so it's about five megahertz wide, but there are several other phone call uh, transmission bands that are within our uh, in-band, uh, uh, sorry, our bound pass as well. And so when, when you get a few of these going off at once, they can create what looks like quite convincing um, uh, candidates if you look at just a single, a single beam. So this is actually, um, this is an RFI candidate, it's not an FRB. Um, you can see that it, the, the background's a little bit ratty and that might, uh, that might give you a little bit of pause if you didn't have anything else uh, to look at anyway. But the thing is we get something like 100,000 false positives like this per hour. Um, and not, not all of them quite as convincing as, as this, of course, but they, and they do tend to be clustered in time. And so that's quite bad for our real-time load balancing. So if you get too many things coming in at once, you can start to run out of space in your buffer and you would hate to have your buffer run out when a real FRB did arrive. So we're really looking to try and get around that. But fortunately, um, to combat our biggest enemy, we have our biggest ally, which is spatial information. So I'm just gonna show here the, the same set of data as taken from adjacent fan beams on the sky. So these are these long skinny beams next to each other. And if I move it forwards and backwards, you can see that the, the phone call is present firstly in all of the beams. And that's not something you would expect from something astrophysical, something coming in in a plane wave should be present at, in one or at most two beams if it's arriving in an overlap region. And also it tends to move, it seems to move a little bit in time. And that's a, a function again of the curved wavefront of the, of the local RFI source. And so we think, we thought we should be able to make use of this information. Um, and the way we're going to do that is by uh, feeding not just one beam's worth of time, frequency, power to, to a classifier uh, at one go, but multiple beams. And so if you have a, an astrophysical source like shown here, well, this is a, like a fake astrophysical source, but near enough, um, you expect to see it in uh, one or two beams, depending on where exactly where on the sky it lands. Whereas RFI, you will see in a lot of beams with some you know, uh, time dependence in the, in the structure. And so this is information that you don't, you don't normally have access to if you're looking at just a single pixel. Um, from uh, either, a, either a single pixel telescope or a beam in isolation from, a, from an interferometer. So what we've developed or what Aishi has developed is um, basically a two-stage convolutional neural network to, to, to take advantage of this spatial information. Um, and the way, we're, the way we've implemented it is to take the, the input data, which is 192 beams on the sky and then the time frequency, and chunk that up into blocks of three beams at a time and uh, 2000 time samples at a time and feed that into a direct classifier. So by this, I mean, there's no dispersion done first, no, no dispersion trials. Um, that, that classifier has been trained using um, uh, synthetic FRBs injected on the top of real, real noise to identify um, things that look like they might be FRBs. And so if you run the numbers, you see that there's about hundred blocks a second going in to this direct classifier. And what comes out is a, a only about one in every thousand does it say there's maybe something here. So about one block per minute. So then we take that, 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 sorry, Ben? Two minutes, sorry. Thank you. So then we take that, that one block that says that may have something of interest in it. We grab a bit more data. So we grab a couple of extra beams on either side uh, and we do our D dispersion and boxcar averaging. So matching the, 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 the time scale of the FRB and thresholding and we take the best couple of candidates we can find in that in that one little block of time and we feed it we do the d dispersion and then feed it to uh, a second convolutional neural network which was uh, based on a very similar architecture to fetch um, that goes and looks to see uh, is this really definitely an frb or not and the output of that we think is uh, lower than one false positive a day so reducing the the candidate rate by you know about six or seven orders of magnitude so this is a really neat system, I think, because it can be trained using injected FRBs. And what we've used so far is about 100,000 uh, synthetic FRBs and 100,000 control blocks. And we can stream that through basically continuously. So we can, we can keep retraining with new data uh, to take into account changing RFI or changing, changing, time, uh, uh, very changing time properties of the, of the data. And the biggest problem we have at the moment, the biggest challenge we have, is that too few false positives leak through from the first stage to give us a good training step for the second stage. So what we've done so far is um, rather than taking only things that have failed the first stage, we take uh, candidates generated by a traditional 
dispersion and thresholding search like Heimdall. Um, and we see that uh, the second stage classifier also performs fabulously well on them. So it picks up every single last FRB and only lets through a couple of uh, false positives. But it would be naive to think that these two things are completely uncorrelated at the moment. And so what we need to be able to do is run our first stage classifier for a bit longer um, to generate enough, uh, you know, uh, tricky things to, to, to train the second stage classifier on. Um, I'm just about out of time. So uh, I'll also just say that um, in addition to the FRB program, we have a very active pulsar timing program. At utmost, we can do about uh, 100 pulsars a day using you know, several tighter A beams at once. And that can all happen at the same time with, with the FRB search. And the, the tighter A beams that we use to time pulsars, we can also point at other interesting sources like magnetars, repeating FRBs, whatever we would like to target for follow up. So um, given that I am out of time, um, I'll just summarize by saying, we're now at the stage that we're running pulsars in the kind of routine mode that we'd like to. The trigger system is ready to accept triggers from the east-west arm and the north-south detector and trigger system is going to be turned on hopefully very, very soon. And the data is on disk to, uh, to do the tests of the correlation and imaging. Um, and like I said, I would be doing it right now if I wasn't giving this talk probably. But the most important thing is that I'd like to give a huge thanks to the team, both the, the individuals at site that have been working really, really hard to get the, uh, to get the hardware and uh, uh, software deployed and running there and uh, everyone at Swinburne that's been working on it as well. So thank you. Any questions? Um, since I don't see any questions, we will move on to, the, to our next speaker, which will be live presentation from Robert Wharton uh, from JPL. Uh, he will be presenting an arc second localization of FRB 2020-1124A with the UGMRT. Okay, uh, <clears throat> thanks. Uh, hi everybody. Um, hold up, let me get rid of this thingy. Okay. Uh, good enough. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the uh, yeah the arc second localization of FRB 2020-1124A with the GMRT, and this is on behalf of a larger collaboration, which are people listed below, and uh, I've highlighted the graduate students in yellow. And apologies to Henning, who apparently in the recording talk I listed as a graduate student. Um, ugh. All right. Uh, so just a little bit of background on the, uh, the GMRT. It's an interferometric array located in, in India, and it consists of 30 45 meter dishes um, with baselines that go up to about 30 kilometers. So the, the U in UGMRT means upgraded, and that's because it was upgraded a few years ago. And, um, you know, there were a bunch of things that were upgraded, but, but one of the key takeaways um, that we care about here is that it can now handle um, larger instantaneous bandwidth. So you can get a couple hundred megahertz worth of bandwidth um, from each of the bands. And as you can see here, there's, there's a variety of bands that range, um, that cover frequencies from about 100 to up to uh, 1500 megahertz. Um, and in addition to imaging, you can do uh, some cool stuff with, uh, FRBs and pulsars as well. So we've heard a little bit about coherent and incoherent array, but just, you know, so we're all on the same page. Let me just talk about the, the two modes at the, the GMRT. So one is the phased array mode, which is the sort of standard phased array mode where you coherently combine the signals from all of the antennas. And in this case, your beam size is the synthesized beam, which means that it's quite small. Um, all of these things, the numbers that I'm going to give here are referenced to 650 megahertz. So let me just get that out of the way first. Um, but so the synthesized beam at, at 650 megahertz is about four arc seconds. So to use this, you really need to know exactly where you want to look. Um, but it does give you the maximum sensitivity because you're coherently combining things. So if you're going to do a, you know, look for FRBs, you can get a fluence, a 10 sigma fluid threshold of about half a Jansky millisecond, which is quite good. Um, there's also this incoherent array mode um, in which you, well, as the name suggests, incoherently combine the antennas and you get a bit less sensitivity, but one of the huge uh, benefits is that instead of having this teeny tiny synthesized beam, you get to use the full um, primary beam of a single antenna. So at 650 megahertz, this is about 42 arc minutes, which really helps if you don't know exactly where you want to look. Now, the sensitivity is a bit less, 
but it's still not that bad. So the incoherent array here, you can get a fluence uh, threshold of about three Jansky milliseconds. And the GMRT is really great in terms of flexibility. You can do all kinds of things with your time and frequency resolution and polarimetry. You can do coherent D dispersion. You can do subarrays where different parts of the array are looking at different frequencies. Uh, and you can also mix and match and do some of these simultaneously. Basically, the only limitation is the data rate and, uh, and your imagination. Um, right, so I want to talk about using the GMRT to look at uh, FRBs and specifically chime uh, repeaters. Uh, so one of the nice things you can do is if you've already got your um, repeater localized to arc second uh, localization or better from, uh, you know, one of the talks that we've heard today, um, you can follow it up with the GMRT in the phased array mode because it'll fit within that tiny synthesized beam. And the GMRT is really great because it has frequency coverage that overlaps with the chime band. So if you observe in band four, that's 550 to 850 megahertz, which is nice. Uh, of course, you can see any source that, that chime can see. And I mentioned the sort of subarrays. And one of the cool things about subarrays is that you can um, use different frequencies in each subarray. So you can get sort of even wider bandwidths. And I'd recommend this lightning talk by Surya. Um, Right, uh, so we did this for uh, FRB 2018-09-16B, um, where we use the phased array to take a look at it, and you get some really cool uh, so bursts, so you can take a look at that paper uh, I've given the reference below. But another thing you can do is you can also uh, localize these repeaters. And, um, you know, I think Srihar's covered a little bit about, you know, the basic strategy, but for us here, um, uh, one of the nice things, again, is we've got this very wide field of view. Um, so you can cover a sort of basic chime uncertainty region with one pointing, or maybe you need to use a couple. That's not too bad. Um, but the, the really great benefit is, again, the same frequency, which I'll keep coming back to. Um, just takes a lot of the guesswork um, out of uh, transferring chime rates to, to what you'd expect here at the GMRT. Um, so uh, the way that we... Uh, are, are doing this is our basic strategy is that we observe with the incoherent array where you get that big beam. And then we also record uh, visibility data at the highest time resolution possible, which is 670 milliseconds. So then you can identify bursts in the incoherent array and then just go over to the visibilities, take out that little time snippet and make a snapshot burst. So here's a, a, a proof of concept we did with, um, with uh, R3. Okay, so let's say you want to use the chime. Let's say you want to use chime. Let's say you want to use the GMRT to localize chime repeaters. What, what are what are the pros and cons here? Well, as I've said several times uh, already, uh, one of the greatest, one of the good things is that you can observe at the same frequencies at which they're discovered, or at which you know uh, chime will be telling you about the activity. So that's really nice. You also have the wide field of view. Um, the incoherent array is comparable in sensitivity to chime. So again, you don't have to do a lot of guesswork uh, comparing the rates. Um, of course, you have continuum imaging for free, so you can search for persistent radio sources. Um, and then you also have all this time frequency uh, options that you can use. The, the downsides are that you have, um, you're limited in terms of your imaging sensitivity because of the, uh, the time resolution of the visibilities, which can only go down to 670 milliseconds, but that is not a huge uh, problem. Um, you need an active source, but that's more about uh, scheduling than anything the GMRT uh, is doing. Um, oh, and also, uh, since we've basically just sort of started this collaboration, there's only a few of us, uh, we don't have any sort of like uh, super uh, uh, polished pipelines yet. So a lot of it is, is done uh, a bit slowly. So these are handcrafted localizations to put a positive spin on it. Um, okay, so now let's talk about FRB 2020-11-24A. So we've heard a lot of really nice talks about this, so I don't have to go into a lot of the details, but I do want to give a little timeline um, uh, for how we went through this, if you'll indulge that. But anyway, this, um, this, this FRB had a huge, very high burst rate, and they were bright bursts, so it's a perfect candidate for us to test this out on. So here's a quick timeline here. So 31st of March is when the Chime ATEL goes out. So that's when the first time that we heard about it. Um, so the next day we submitted our GMRT DDT and two days later, the DDT was awarded time. So, and uh, on two days after that, which I think is a Monday. So all of that was happening over the weekend. We were already on telescope. So huge thanks to the GMRT uh, TAC and everybody there for just turning, turning that around very, very quickly. 
Um, so we get our data on the 5th of April, and then we uh, put out these two ATELs on the persistent, I'll call it persistent, persistent emission, and then also the localization. So nine days end to end, I think is pretty good. Um, it wasn't pretty good enough <laughs> to be first. Uh, so it, uh, obviously we've heard about these other uh, localizations, but considering that a lot of this was sort of done by hand, I think it's pretty good. Okay, um, so we got the time and we observed for three hours um, at band four, which is 550 to 750 megahertz. And we got uh, incoherent array uh, data, sampled at a time sample of 0.6 milliseconds because we just really cared about the detections. Um, and then the visibility time resolution was the 0.6 seconds, you know, as fast as it can go. And uh, in that three hours, we detected 48 bursts in the incoherent array beam. And I've sort of given a, a, a panorama of that uh, over there. And the fluences range from three to uh, up to 108 Jansky milliseconds. So it's kind of hard to see uh, anything about the burst. There's clearly some RFI, which the incoherent array um, had, you know, it's a little bit worse. Uh, so here's just, I'll just pick four kind of random bursts and they look cool. Um, but if you want to, if you want more information, then they look kind of cool. Uh, I suggest you 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 check out this um, this paper uh, uh, that came out on the ar archive uh, today. Okay, but the whole point of this thing was localization, right? So let's get into that. Um, so I said we detected forty eight bursts in the incoherent array time stream data. Um, so then what we did was we, we had all the TOAs so we could go and we could make images in sort of snippets of data. In this case, we've taken six seconds, which is um, a bit long, but I, I can maybe talk about that later, uh, and um, made images for all of the 48 bursts. And we make detections of 34 of them. And in this image on the right, uh, the background, the blue thing, is the continuum uh, image from the whole observation. So that's the persistent radio emission. And this is a 10 by 10 arc second square. Um, the burst uh, one sigma statistical RA and deck uncertainty, so just on the fits, um, are given as yellow ellipses. And the white ellipse gives the synthesized beam uh, for the full observation. So you can see that basically they all kind of roughly fit within that synthesized beam and most of them are pretty clustered. Uh, so that's good. Um, one thing you can also do is you can take all of the time snippets from all of the bursts and just make one combined image that's like, you know, oops all bursts kind of thing. And um, uh, when you do that, you can also fit. So, so that's what this combined ellipse is. It's the one sigma R and deck uncertainties um, for that combined image. And just sort of for clarity of presentation, I think I'll just stick with that. Um, I said that the background is this persistent radio emission. You'll note I'm being very careful not to call it a PRS, um, but you can also fit the centroid to that. And, uh, you know, it's also very close, close by. Um, what's nice about this, uh, well, I guess it's nice now, is that we, we kind of know the answer, right? That VLBI X is where the bursts are supposed to be coming from. Um, so we still need to understand our systematics a bit. So that's what we'll... Um, a forthcoming publication will go and tackle all of that. Um, so I think that um, this is a, a really good example for us to test out our system on. Uh, and we've heard of the other talks about how the uh, persistent radio emission is, is likely from star formation and is not compact, but uh, it's still kind of neat. And, uh, you know, just for the record here, the other, the ASCAP and the VLA uh, localizations. So look forward to that. Um, but um, right, so after the localization, we still have all of these bursts and you can still do science with them. Um, I'm showing here uh, some work. Uh, well, the, the burst on the left is from our uh, incoherent array data. It's the brightest burst. And the burst on the right is from a, an, an Effelsberg campaign that uh, Henning talked about in his uh, plenary uh, session talk. And uh, from our GMRT and our Effelsberg observations, we get tons of bursts in both of them. Uh, so we can do a lot of really cool things there where we can measure the scintillation bandwidth. Um, and in fact, we can cross we can correlate uh, the, the pulses to, to calculate um, uh, scintillation time scale. So that's what's on the right. And um, I highly recommend checking out either Henning's talk or um, this uh, paper I've given the archive link, which should have shown up today, which goes into all the detail. And there's, you know, scintillation, time scale, bandwidth, velocity, anything with scintillation in front. Um, 
Okay, yeah, so just, just a quick summary here. Um, in this campaign here, we detected 48 bursts in three hours with the GMRT. We imaged 34 of them and were able to produce a, an arc second localization. We found a, a radio source coincident with the burst. Of course, this has turned out to be resolved and is likely from star formation. And we were managed to do this within a nine days of the chime alert, which I think is pretty good. And hopefully we can um, maybe improve on that a little bit. Uh, we have a paper uh, coming out uh, that talks about the, the fluence, the DM, the bursts, all the burst properties that you could want is in this Marty et al. paper. And then all the scintillation stuff you could want is in this main et al. paper. And the Wharton et al. one is uh, still to come. Um, so what about uh, future and ongoing work? Um, we have been uh, using the GMRT to look at a couple FRBs. Uh, so use, these are with the phased array. Um, we have a, a project that looks at 2018, nine, whatever, that one, um, to do full polarimetry and multi-frequency observations over the course of uh, the cycle. D don't hold me to orbit. I'm sorry, that was a subliminal or whatever. Um, and uh, we also have one following up on 2020, 11, 24A, looking for annual variation of uh, scintillation. And finally, we also want to uh, try and continue localizing uh, new repeaters. And in this, we have a target of opportunity proposal submitted to the GMRT, where we can uh, we plan to work with the CHIME FRB and target sources with baseband localizations and then trigger on bursts and, um, and then hopefully uh, use that to, to very efficiently make localizations using a small amount of, uh, of telescope time. And to make it official, I crafted this uh, wonderful logo. Uh, so thank you to everybody, and thanks especially to everyone at the GMRT who uh, who um, made all of this this possible. So thanks. Thanks so much for the talk. Um, so we have one question from Benito from individual burst localization showing in the yellow like ellipses. Uh, they look like they have completely different elongations and uh, PAs. What's the reason? Oh yeah, okay. So that's because we haven't really done it in a very good way right now. Basically, we just you know we image the bursts and we use the CASA sort of uh, IMFIT thing, and I'm just giving the RA and DEC uncertainties that are produced there. Uh, you're absolutely right. You know, if you were to when we do it properly, it um, it will look closer to the synthesized beam in terms of the uncertainties. And there is another question from Wenfei. Uh, Thanks for the great talk, Robert. Amazing work by the GMRT team. Uh, for this, uh, for this verse, I noticed the PRE is offset from the host center and FRB position. Does the black PRE circle actually represent the true uncertainty? or are the actual uncertainties much larger? Oh, yeah, 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 I'm sorry. I really meant to emphasize that stronger, but um, the, the uncertainties that are given there are just the one sigma statistical uncertainties in the fit. Uh, in reality, the, the systematics will be, be larger than that. I think the main takeaway right now that we can say is that, you know, they're in the same synthesized beam. So as far as we know, they are coincident, but that's what this, um, further work in terms of understanding our and, and better quantifying our, our systematics will hopefully be able to give a good answer to that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for answering all the questions. Let me see if there is something on the Slack. No, so um, we should move on to our last speaker of this session. Um, Juan uh, Mena Para from MIT and he will be talking he will be talking about CHIME FRB outriggers and CHORD, uh, new instruments from localization fast, localization of FRBs. Go ahead, Juan. Thanks. Um, yeah, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for attending this talk. Um, well, today I, I, I'm a MIT Kali fellow and, and today I'll talk to you about CHIME FRB outriggers and CHORD, which are two new instruments for localizations of FRBs. So, um, well, through FRB 2021, we have uh, had the opportunity to see how CHIME has become the, the leading uh, facility for uh, detecting uh, past radio bursts. Um, since the start of operations in like uh, 2018, we have det detected uh, thousands of FRBs. 
and probably one of the most important outcomes of the project has been the recent release of the of the first time FRB catalog with more than 500 FRBs, including uh, multiple events from repeating sources. So here I'm just showing a, a few examples of the analysis that have been enabled by by such a large sum, large sample of events uh, collected with a with a single instrument. Um, there we have studies of dispersion scattering properties from from Pragya, um, post morphology from Siggy. Um, do not miss the talk from Masood on cross correlations with large scale structure. That's tomorrow. Um, sky distribution from Alex Safi, and there are more uh, analyses. Uh, papers and exciting results that will come soon. So please stay tuned. However, at this point, you, you probably uh, have realized that uh, one of the most important limitations for uh, of Chime for FRB science is, is localization. Now, remember that um, the Chime, Chime compact array design and the cylindrical structure uh, basically, the design in general were was all driven by by cosmology goals. In, in particular, as its name suggests, by the goal to trace the expansion, the expansion history of the universe by uh, measuring the the large scale structure of neutral hydrogen. Now, it was during the construction of time that uh, we realized that this could also be a great instrument for uh, um, trans radio transient science. So after commissioning, the, the correlator was uh, upgraded to perform additional additional operations for pulsar timing and FRB science. Now, um, CHIME operates an interferometer with uh, maximum baselines of about, uh, of about uh, 100 meters. And with that, we typically provide uh, arc minute uh, localization, which um, sometimes is enough to localize uh, uh, low DM FRBs, as we already saw from um, Mohit's presentation. But in general, it's, it's not enough to, to, uh, to tell the host uh, galaxy, let alone the, the region within, within the galaxy. Right? If we want to be able to tell the, the, to identify the host galaxy, uh, we require uh, arc second localization, which for um, uh, interferometer oper operating at uh, chime frequencies requires uh, baselines greater than 100 kilometers. And if uh, additionally we want to be able to tell the, the, the location or the region within the galaxy, we would need a super second localization. So uh, basically baselines greater than 1,000 uh, kilometers. Um, and and th this means that we would need uh, uh, VLBI with uh, um, continental baselines. So to overcome this limitation, uh, we are developing China for VL records which is a program to um, uh, deploy uh, small versions of CHIME, of the CHIME telescope, uh, baselines ranging from uh, 100 kilometers to, to several thousands of kilometers. And these outriggers are gonna work with, uh, together with CHIME and, uh, and the CHIME for back backhand uh, to work as a, as a VLBI array with the sensitivity to detect uh, hundreds of FRBs each year with 50 milliard second uh, precisions. Uh, precision in, in near real time. So we will that, that will allow us to identify not only host galaxies, but also FRB environments within the host. Now, why, why is this hard? <clears throat> so if we knew um, when and where the, the next uh, FRB event is going to occur, then what we could do with a telescope like CHIME Remember that that Chime is a stationary telescope. Uh, but if if that location was within the philosophy of Chime, what we could do is is digitally point the telescope to that location at the right right time and record the data. Um, and this means that instead of having to process and save um, the the data from each antenna in the array, which we have thousands in Chime, we would only need to save the data from. Um, um, uh, coherently added signal from from all the antennas, which is a much uh, a more manageable uh, data volume. So the challenge with FRB VLBI is that we don't know we don't know when or where the next FRB in general we don't know when or where the next FRB event is going to occur. So we have to process massive data rates in in real time in order to uh, detect these events in blind searches with wide fields of view. Um, and as an example, uh, the, the internal data rate of the chime correlator is 6.6 .6 terabits per second, and that of each operator is going to be uh, about 0.8 terabits per second. Um, 
we cannot say continuously those uh, such high data rates. So our solution is to adopt a trigger approach where we uh, each trigger keeps its, its data in memory and we only save it to, to this when we receive a, a trigger from the Chime FRB real time uh, pipeline. So let's uh, check out this diagram to see how that works. Um, at Chime, uh, the correlator digitizes the voltages that encode the electric field received from each antenna. And then it also separates the full bandwidth for each signal and separates it into narrow frequency channels. That's what we call base, baseband or channelized voltages. Now, uh, the X engine of the correlator uses the baseband data to form static intensity beams that are fed to the FRB, uh, uh, the Chime FRB backend that searches uh, um, uh, for highly uh, dispersed transients uh, in real time. Now, uh, at the same time, the correlator is equipped with a, um, a ring buffer that allows it to keep about 40 seconds of data, uh, of baseband data in memory, such that when the uh, Chime FRB backhand detects an FRB candidate, um, the correlator receives a signal to save that baseband data um, to disk. Now, at the same time, each rigger is also going to be equipped with uh, with the same uh, ring buffer system, so it will keep its local baseband data uh, in memory, and it will write it to this when uh, when we when it receives receives the, the trigger from from Chime FRB, and and then the the local data from each uh, rigger is going to be transmitted to a central facility where the where the signals are correlated together, and in this way, basically, the the, the riggers operate as a, a some interferometer that has the same angular resolution of, a, of an ideal telescope with the, the aperture of, of thousands of kilometers. Now, the, the Chime FRB team at MIT includes uh, Professor Kiyoshi Masui and grad student uh, Calvin Leung. And together, we led the effort to demonstrate the trigger FRB VLDI technique for Chime FRB riggers. Um, for that, we used the Chime Pathfinder which is a small, a small scale prototype of Chime with the identical design and, and field of view. And it has uh, the same uh, collecting area of the outriggers that we're building. Um, the Pathfinder is located about 400 meters uh, from, from Chime and it was, and we built it before uh, the main telescope as a test bed for technology development. Um, the, the telescope had been offline for uh, a few years so what we did was uh, we recovered the telescope and we upgraded uh, its back end to operate as an outrigger. So now the, teles the telescope is equipped with a, a custom wideband uh, recorder that is programmed to write its baseband data to this when we receive a trigger from, from Chime FRB. So this dynamic spectrum, that I'm showing, the dynamic spectrum that I'm showing here is an example of uh, an FRB detected interferometrically between the two telescopes operating uh, independently. Um, so with this, not only we we proved uh, we demonstrated the, the triggering and, and recording system, but we also uh, developed uh, wide field calibration techniques that we're uh, using now with the new with the new operators. The other important challenge for Chime FRB operators is calibration. The main the main problem being that it is it, it's hard to find a steady uh, radio sources that correlate on thousand kilometer baselines uh, at, in the Chime band. Right? Um, um, this uh, complicates more by the fact that Chime is a, is a stationary telescope, so we can only observe uh, sources uh, when they transit the field view. Of course, the, the list of, um, of uh, calibrators that can be used at low frequency, VLB calibrators that can be used at low frequencies is increasing thanks to, for example, the, the effort of, uh, of uh, low part. But still, we, we need a, a good uh, set of uh, uh, calibrators to use with, with Chime FRB outbreakers. So our strategy is to also use uh, pulsars as, as calibrators. Uh, the advantage of pulsars is that, well, they are compact. They can be separated from the uh, steady radio background from their pulses, and they are sufficiently abundant to be used as the primary sources for uh, phase uh, calibration. So um, the plot that I'm showing here on the top is um, a Cartesian projection of the uh, initial set of bright pulsars that we plan to use for calibration uh, in FRB, in Chime FRB outriggers. 
and uh, Jane Kaxmarek from uh, DRAO and Alice Horton from uh, uh, a grad student from McGill, they're currently working on, on the localization uh, of all these uh, pulsars to better than five, uh, with better than five millisecond precision using the, B the BLBA. Um, in parallel, the, the um, MIT team is, is developing a timing system that is uh, for both CHIME and the records that is going to keep the whole array uh, synchronized uh, between calibrations using high performance uh, atomic clocks. And what this means is that um, basically for any FRB event that occurs in, a, in either the, the gray region or the yellow region of, of, the, of this plot, uh, we're confident that we can keep the, uh, the um, instrument, uh, instrumental delay errors well controlled such that we can detect uh, we can detect and localize the FRB event to the to the required spec, and we have levers to handle the uh, effect of the ionosphere, which at the chime frequencies is is the uh, basically the main contribution to our uh, um, error budget and loca the localization error budget. Now, for the wide regions, it does not mean that we do not does not mean that we do not need the the, the spec. It just means that we have a bit uh, less room uh, to handle ionospheric errors, but we're going to still do it. Just we're, we're going to need uh, uh, other calibrators, for example, the uh, steady sources if they're available, uh, uh, or another source, another way to infer uh, to try to break the degeneracy between um, um, uh, the ionosphere and the geometric layer. Um, recently, a team led by Professor Keith Vanderland and, and grad student Tomas Casanelli from University of Toronto, they uh, upgraded the 10 meter dish telescope at the Algonquin Radio Observatory in Ontario, uh, Canada. So now the telescope can be operated as an outrigger in basically in the same way as we operate the Pathfinder, except that this is at a baseline of uh, 3000 kilometers. And they use this telescope to perform um, trigger observation, trigger VLBI observations of uh, the craft pulsar, um, basically demonstrating the feasibility of, of, of pulsars as calibrators uh, um, uh, for chamber beta riggers, but also extending the extending the calibration techniques. We well, have two more minutes. Okay, thank you. The the extending the the techniques that were developed of the Pathfinder to handle ionosphere effects. As for the status, the Allen by the construction of the Allen by rigger is uh, is ongoing already. Um, uh, same as with the Green Bank Observatory uh, uh, rigger. And for the third side, uh, there are currently uh, discussions on the, uh, the, the the final location and the specifications. Where we expect we expect to have a final uh, location soon and start construction. Um, Chime FRB riggers represents the first phase of the of CORE, the Canadian Hydrogen Observatory and Radio Transit Detector. And this is a next generation radio telescope that will complement uh, Chime and the riggers with uh, large arrays of dishes uh, instrumented with, wide, with ultra wide ba bandwidth uh, receivers and feeds operating between 0.3 and 1.5 gigahertz. So core will consist of a core with 512 six meter dishes and a rigger uh, with 64 uh, six meter dishes. Um, this uh, uh, instrument will have three times the bandwidth of chime, almost two times its collecting area and have a system temperature. So this, this basically means that we'll have an instrument that will be about an order of magnitude more powerful uh, than, than chime. And, and it will use the same trigger approach as the chime for the uh, riggers. Um, there are several critical technologies that enable uh, this instrument. One is the use of composite uh, material technology to mass produce reflectors that achieve some sub millimeter surface accuracy at a, at a moderate cost. So these dishes are lighter than their metallic counterparts, but they can also be fabricated in one piece. So they're more repeatable and are less, blown, less prone to, to surface errors. And the design and construction are being, uh, are being led, is, is led by uh, the DRA team. Um, as for the bandwidth, the, the team at University of Toronto is developing a, a ultra wideband uh, uh, feed that can be mass produced with uh, high precision at low cost. This is a, a Vivaldi style feed 
And here's uh, some photos of, of one of the recent designs. This one is designed to operate between 0.4 and 2 gigahertz, but the performance is similar to uh, when we move to the to the core band. And uh, well, basically, we 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 meet as, we, we exceed the uh, specs and and measurements agree with uh, with our simulations. Last but not least, we have the um, uh, the team at University of Calgary who's developing a low noise uh, amplifier that can uh, achieve better than 20 Kelvin uh, noise temperature over the core band, which is crucial to achieve better than 30 Kelvin system temperature uh, specification. Um, we're currently building the uh, testbed instrument at DRIO to integrate all the systems and evaluate their performance. Um, this is work led by Dallas Wolf and Denise Olchek uh, from Agile and the, and the DRIO team. Um, the instrument is called D3A6 and will consist of three six meter uh, high precision dishes instrumented with the, with the high bandwidth, uh, with the ultra wide band, bandwidth feed and the receivers. And it will have uh, east west baselines at six, 32, and 39 uh, meters. Um, we expect to, to, to have this instrument, um, we expect to see first light by, by the end of the year. Um, and well, uh, this is this is all I have. Uh, I will leave you with the with the summary, and, and we'll take uh, questions. Thank you. Thanks for the talk. Um, let's wait to see if there are questions. Okay, uh, looks like there are no more questions. So uh, this will be the end of our session. Uh, after this session, there will be a coffee break uh, that at GatherTown that people can join and discuss subsequent things. Um, uh, I guess this is the end of, uh, of this session. Jason, do you have anything else to announce? Uh, I don't, thanks a lot, Wendon, for cheering. And thanks a lot to the speakers as well for the excellent talks. Let's thank the speakers again.